one year into Turkey's military intervention in northern Syria, we break down the cost and the consequences. Hello and welcome, I'm Ali Mustafa, and this is a special edition of Straight Talk from Jarablus in northern Syria. The hustle and bustle tells a different story, but one year ago, this main street in Jarablus became a battleground for Turkish-backed Free Syrian Army and Daesh, which had been in control of Jarablus for a few years till that moment. In the years since, life has returned to normal, but it's quite a tense place. There have been bombings and attacks in Jarablus in the past three weeks. Despite the violence, people are still returning to this town on the Syrian border, as Omer Kablan reports. Two countries divided by a sliding door. We pass through this checkpoint at Karkamish in Turkey on our way to northern Syria. Soldiers from the Free Syrian Army are with us until we reach a safe zone. Jarablus has been in rebel hands since Turkish-backed forces forced out Daesh last year. But reminders of Daesh's rule of terror are everywhere. This building was used by the group as a prison. But here, things have changed for the better. At this school in Jarablus, life is back to normal. A year ago, this playground was in ruins. But now, the football players are back on the field. I meet Ebtisam Hussan, a teacher at the Ahmed Selim Mullah Primary School. Ebtisam fled to Turkey after the Syrian war broke out, and now she's returned. She's training future educators who will join the school faculty in the next school year. كيفي أنا لما أمشي بالشارع بطلت أحس بالخوف إنه ممكن مثلاً طيارة أو ممكن عنصر داعشي يتعرض لنا لأي أمر يعني طبعاً الأمان جداً يعني هذا الأمر الوحيد اللي نحسن نقول صار مية بالمية خلاص. A new Jarablus is being rebuilt on the ruins of the old, and cement from Turkey is helping the reconstruction. FSA fighters patrol the streets along with the Turkish armed forces. They're on the lookout for terrorists who might have sneaked in to the city. I meet Ahmed Tahir, who runs a store out of his small house. He invites me inside his house, where he lives with his wife and three children. عندما أتيت إلى جراب استفاجأت بوجود داعش داعش كانت أظلم من النظام داعش فاجأت بوجود داعش أرادوا مني أن أنتسب إلى داعش نتيجة هذه الظروف أخذت عائلتي وهربت إلى تركيا Between 2013 and 2016 more than 3,000 people lived in Jarablus but now it's home to 60,000 people and more are returning. Back at the primary school, the teachers have ended their day and are heading home. But for Ehtisab, the job isn't done. أكيد الحرب نتمناها أنها تنتهي لكن تنتهي لما الثورة تنجح يعني. As Jarablus marks one year since Turkish-backed forces retook it, there is a sense of relief in Jarablus. But more than that, for many who've returned, Jarablus has become a symbol of hope in Syria. Omar Kablan, Straight Talk. And to get a better sense of how life is like in Jarablus, I'm joined by Abid Khalil, who's the head of the local council. Abid, how is life like now in Jarablus? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
طبعا بدات الحياه تعود الى طبيعتها في مدينه جرابلس بعد خروج داعش في 24/8/2016 الامور الحياه تقريبا متوفره بالحد الادنى من كهرباء ومياه وخدمات اخرى نظافه وما شابه رغم وجود صعوبات كبيره تواجهنا بسبب كثره النازحين في المدينه لانها اصبحت منطقه امله وماهوله بالسكان What are some of the problems and difficulties people are facing وبالنسبة للمشاكل التي تواجه أغلب الموجودين في منطقة جرابلس طبعا هو تأمين السكن للأخوة النازحين القادمين من الريف الشرقي ومن حمص ومن بقية المناطق الأخرى طبعا منطقة جرابلس كما ذكرنا أصبحت آمنة وأصبح فيها عدد سكان يفوق عدد السكان الحالي سابقا كان عدد السكان في مدينة جرابلس 25 ألف نسمة حاليا 60 ألف نسمة في المدينة فقط ويبلغ 200 ألف نسمة في جرابلس وريفها طبعا يوجد أناس كثيرين بحاجة إلى سكن ومأوى الخدمات التي متوفرة في المدينة لا تكفي لجميع الأخوة الضيوف طبعا بحاجة لتأمين شقق سكنية ومشاريع سكنية كبيرة لاستقبال الأخوة الضيوف القادمين من بقية المناطق السورية الأخرى. What help are Turkish officials providing the local council? طبعا الحكومة التركية قدمت الكثير لمدينة جرابلس. طبعا هي بالدرجة الأولى ساعدتنا في تحرير مدينة جرابلس من رجز داعش. قدمت مشفى جرابلس الذي يستقبل ألف معينة يوميا تقريبا. قدمت جهاز للشرطة. ساهمت في بناء المدارس وإعادة فتحها وتأهيلها يوجد حوالي 80 إلى 90 مدرسة حاليا في جرابلس وريفها مجهزة بالكوادر التعليمية كاملة عبد الخليل شكرا أهلا وسهلا Still to come on Straight Talk. We break down Operation Euphrates Shield and its objectives. Did Turkey achieve its goals or was it just on behalf of the Syrians? And what does the future hold? We explore why Turkey says there's unfinished business in Jarablus and in northern Syria as a whole. One year ago, as Turkish-backed forces and the FSA moved into Jarablus, dislodged Daesh, they had to move through several minefields. I was in a border town called Karkamish on the Turkish side and you could feel the impact of all those explosions in that town as well. It showed that Daesh was completely entrenched, not just in Jarablus, but in much of northern Syria. How did they get here and what did Turkey do as a response against Daesh? Aisha Jamal explains. One year ago, Ankara launched a military operation in northern Syria. Under Operation Euphrates Shield, Turkey sent troops, tanks and warplanes to support the Free Syrian Army, an opposition group fighting for the ideals of the revolution. Turkey and Syria share a long border, and whatever happens there directly affects Turkey. One of the aims of the military campaign was to clear the border from terrorist groups. Since early 2016, Daesh repeatedly attacked the Turkish city of Kilis from Syria. One of TRT World's reporters experienced this firsthand. Just days before the operation was launched, a Daesh suicide bomber attacked a wedding in Gaziantep, killing more than 50 people. The other aim of Operation Euphrates Shield was to block the YPG, which Turkey considers a terrorist group, from crossing the Euphrates and connecting its cantons in northern Syria. The operation began in the strategic town of Jarablus, which Daesh had controlled for two years. The Turkish-backed opposition fighters overran Jarablus in just one day. They then opened a new front by taking al Rai. What followed were significant and symbolic victories. In Dabik, where Daesh had claimed its final victory would take place, and in Al-Bab, Daesh's second largest city in Syria, after Raqqa. With that, the operation ended and more than 2,000 square kilometers of the Syrian border had been cleared. Turkish officials say Euphrates Shield reached its goals. It pushed back Daesh and prevented another terror group from controlling the entire Syrian side of the border. Another goal was to create a home away from home for persecuted Syrian civilians. 
And to discuss Operation Euphrates Shield and the battles the Free Syrian Army has fought since, I'm joined by Abdul Razak Khalil, who's the commander of the FSA. Now, you were part of the battle for the liberation of Jarablus. Tell us the fight that took place here one year ago. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Naqib Abdul Razak Khalil, Liwa al-Shamal. Alhamdulillah, Mada Am ala Tahrir Madin Jarablus, Min al Arhab. أهم الإنجازات تحققت في مدينة جرابلس تحرير مدينة جرابلس من الإرهاب هذا أهم حدث اثنين عودة الأهالي مدينة جرابلس النازحين بسبب إرهاب داعش إلى جرابلس أمر الآخر فتح المدارس إعداد جيل مثقف بالإضافة لبناء البنى التحتية بناء البنى التحتية من أجل الأهالي والسكان بالإضافة إلى المشاريع الاقتصادية والمشاريع الانتاجية التي عمل بها السكان نتيجة الأمن والطمأنينة يلي حصلت في مدينة جرابلس وفي كافة منطقة درع الفرات حيث تتعرض منطقة درع الفرات من أهم خطر هو خطر إرهاب المتمثل بداعش بسبب تصرفاته اللا إنسانية بالإضافة للبي واي دي والبي كي أصحاب المشروع الانفصالي الذين يسعون إلى تقسيم سوريا نحن كجيش حر سنقاتل الإرهاب أينما وجد إذا كان داعش أو البي كي والبي واي دي الانفصاليين الذين يسعون دائما إلى فصل أو قطعة من سوريا what about the overall situation in Syria right now as far as the fighting is concerned? توزع القوى المتقاتلة في سوريا من الغرب عفرين الذي تسيطر عليها البي كي كي والبي واي دي بالإضافة إلى مدينة الرفعة المحتلة من قبل البي كي كي والبي واي دي بالإضافة إلى مدينة تادف المحتلة من قبل نظام الأسد بالإضافة لمدينة العريمة بي كي كي بي واي دي حليف نظام بشار الأسد بالإضافة لمنبج هذه المناطق هي تحت سيطرة البي كي كي والبي واي دي أعزاز الباب جرابلس تحت سيطرة قوات درع الفرات التي هزمت الأرهاب من هذه المنطقة الآن في منطقة درع الفرات توجد كثافة سكانية نتيجة الأمن والطمأنينة الذي يشعر بها المواطنين بعودتهم إلى منازلهم الحقيقية وإلى أراضيهم بالإضافة في أن مناطق البي كي كي والبي واي دي تعاني من الهجرة القسرية تعاني من تجنيد الشباب القسري للحروب في الرقة وبمناطق أخرى هذا التجنيد هو تجنيد إرجاء إجباري وملزم للإناث وللذكور أما في مدينة منبج فهناك ضغط وتهجير قسري وألزام شباب منبج من العرب والكرد بالتجنيد الإجباري للذهاب إلى جبهات الانفصاليين أما نظام بشار أسد في الحياة في منطقة نظام الأسد هي حياة جحيمة نتيجة تسلط الشبيحة تسلط الشبيحة على المواطنين من ارتكاب مجازر من ارتكاب حالات اقتصاب شهد لها الإعلام العالمي بأن هناك اقتصاب وحالات سرقة وحالات نهب ولا يوجد أي استقرار في مناطق النظام على عكس مناطق درع الفرات التي تسير فيها الحياة بشكل جيد كمان خليل شكرا At the onset of Operation Euphrates Shield, once Daesh was expelled from Jarablus, the Turkish military had to contend with another threat, the YPG, that PKK-linked terror group that operates in Syria. Just to give you guys an idea of what that means, that hill range behind me is where the Euphrates River runs. And across the other side, on the other side of it, is where the YPG and its forces have been stationed to get an idea of what the YPG is and why is it such a big threat to Turkey, Adil Halim has this report. 
It made the rounds on social media. Video of rifle-toting women fighting for the YPG and taking on Daesh. The images were well received in much of the Western world and helped the YPG gain public support. What the PKK or the YPG or whatever you might want to call them, what they have done very successfully in these past several years is uh, score a PR victory. The U.S. has also increasingly relied on the YPG to fight Daesh in Syria. But that should not uh, cloud our view of the realities on the ground. And here I'm referring to the interchangeability uh, in terms of the rank and file between the YPG and the PKK with many PKK, experienced PKK guerrillas serving in the ranks of the YPG and actually accounting for a lot of the uh, successes the YPG has seen against the Islamic State. A UK-based think tank goes a step further, linking the group to the PKK. Considered a terrorist organization by the US, EU, Turkey and NATO. And the Henry Jackson Society says in a new report that the PKK tried to rebrand itself through a network of organizations like the YPG, but the think tank says they're organically integrated components and not affiliates or offshoots of the PKK. Kyle Orton says the fact is the PKK and the YPG are the same entity. One of the most senior U.S. generals also recently said the U.S. had urged the YPG two years ago to rebrand itself. If they continue to keep linkage to, you know, past, you know, past, uh, you know, past product or you know, PKK linkage specifically. This the relationship is fraught with challenges. Soon after, the YPG called itself the Syrian Democratic Forces. But in May, the U.S. announced it would directly support the YPG with arms and vehicles. Tension grew between Ankara and Washington because Turkey considers the YPG to be the Syrian branch of the PKK. Özellikle YPG, PYD terör örgütünün hangi ülke tarafından olursa olsun muhatap olarak alınması bu konuda küresel düzeyde varılan mutabakata kesinlikle uygun değildir. The threat of various terrorist groups is still there for all the players on the ground. But the biggest issue for Turkey is the YPG. Adil Halim, Straight Talk. And to discuss Turkey's threat perception in northern Syria, I'm joined by Omer Aslan. He's a professor of national security at the Turkish National Police Academy. Thank you for joining us from Ankara, Omer. Thanks for having me. Omer, why does the U.S. consider the YPG as part of the SDF to be such an effective fighting force against Daesh in Raqqa? Actually, it has been an effective force. Uh, in, in quotation marks, maybe I should put it. Uh, has been through uh, the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Air Support, actually. And this is, so the SDF has been, a, has been an effective fighting force on the ground, uh, largely thanks to the U.S. Air Force, which first bombed different places where uh, an operation has been going on, and only then, after the city has been largely bombed, then the SDF comes and sort of clears the ground. And that is actually, uh, so the way that this has been going uh, with the SDF operations inside uh, Syria has been established by different groups, different uh, think tanks and different uh, groups that have been watching the conflict in, in Syria, such as International Crisis Group, for example. So the SDF has been an effective force, uh, largely thanks to the U.S. air support and different uh, sort of uh, support given to it by, uh, of course, the U.S. Uh, first and foremost. What would you say then to the Turkish assertion that if the U.S. had supplied weapons and trainings to other groups like the FSA, Free Syrian Army and its factions, that they too could have been effective against Daesh? They could have. They could have. I mean, if the U.S. support was consistent and it was actually uh, given to these groups in a, in a steady manner and if they were given different weapons or the weapons and all the instruments that have been given military instruments given to the sdf they could have been a force of course i mean i'm not rejecting the argument that there has been differences and divisions within those uh, opposition groups uh, beside the, the the sdf but that wasn't the, the cause of uh, their uh, being uh, sort of weak on the ground the, the main reason was that uh, i think 
due to different uh, sort of power balances within within American organization, within American uh, agencies on the ground. I mean, State Department, the, the Pentagon, and their preferences, I think. The SDF was sort of chosen and cherry-picked to, to be a fighting force on the ground, but that doesn't, again, uh, mean that the other groups couldn't have been, but the same level of support was not sort of given to them. One of the fears that the Turkish leadership has expressed to us is that these weapons and the training that the Americans have provided to the YPG may end up being used against Turkish forces because the Turkish government doesn't see any difference between the YPG and the PKK. Are Turkish concerns then justified? Um, they are justified and it's not that uh, those weapons given to the, the, to the YPG may end up inside Turkey, used by the PKK against Turkish soldiers and, and the police, but they are actually being used. There is uh, the a PKK franchise being established in Turkey, Syria, Iran and Iraq, so that is the solid threat against Turkey. Solid threat, by, by solid threat I mean, so there is a terrorist organization that has now uh, increased its, its capability due to basically uh, the weaponry and training given by the U.S. and, and, and perhaps other uh, uh, Western states. But beside the solid, I mean, uh, the, the threat on the ground, there is also the ideological threat, not only to Turkey, but to other countries as well. Because the idea of democratic autonomy, democratic confederalism, all the uh, new sort of, uh, uh, I mean, the, these, these ideas that, that, that sound good, but have been proven otherwise, that have, proven, uh, that have not been proven uh, in Syria. These are the ideological, I think, challenges to Turkey and maybe uh, perhaps even the, the other, other states, because our understanding of democracy now has been negated in, in Syria, and that somehow this negation of understand, our understanding of democracy now somehow finds support uh, I mean, given support by, by the West. Omer Razlan, thank you for joining us from Ankara. My name is Jamal Abdan, from Syria, from the Mawaid, Medina Halab, 1990. I'm working in the Syrian community. I've been in Turkey for four years. سافرت إلى دير الزور في عام 2010-2011 لكن ما درست طبعا كانت ثورة بادئة من جديد كمتظاهرين كان أنفاسنا بين بعض هي أنفاس حب التحرر من العبودية أو حب التحرر من الظلم كنت أحد مطلوبين لتنظيم الدولة أثناء حملة اعتقالات العشوائية الإرهاب اللي كان يمارس علينا هو إرهاب لا تصفه كلمات لمدى قذارته أو لمدى بشاعته في مرحلة قبل الثورة كنا كأي عائلة هاد بن عمي هاد الشغ... هاد الشاب اعتقلوه ليه تقتح مدية الباب بعد بأسبوع اعتقلوا أخوه واعتقلوا والده واعتقلوا أخوه اعتقلوا أخواته اثنين ووالده بعد تسع شهور أفرجوا على الأب والأخ وعدموا الأخ الثاني موضوع انه شاب بس تشهد او اثنين او اثنين اخوه لا موضوع انه قبل ما نخسر الوطن خسرنا عائله بعد سادات قوات درع الفرات اذا حاليا بنلاحظ نزع ديت باب حركه عمران رهيبه جدا طبعا وجود امان وجود الامن حاليا احلامنا تتلخص في بيت في منزل لا اكثر تتلخص في نسمه هواء ممكن ضم تراب ممكن ب ممكن بحجر Next time on Straight Talk we look at the devastating impact cholera has had on Yemen. If you were to ask me a year ago what Jarablus might look like today, I would probably have painted a darker picture of life in the Syrian border town. 
it would have seemed unimaginable that in just one year, there would be a sense of normalcy. Before Turkey arrived, Jarablus was a war zone with Daesh firmly in control. Although the conditions today are far from perfect, Turkey's intervention in the city has changed the situation on the ground. And it's a strategy that's different from other countries fighting Daesh. Turkey has not only fought terrorists, but in Jarablus, it has built the conditions that will allow for refugees to return. Jarablus is one of the only success stories in post daesh -El towns in the Middle East. Mosul in neighboring Iraq is in ruins, and the focus there has been on fighting terrorists, not the welfare of the people. The question the people of Jarablus and most of Syria are asking, shouldn't the return to normalcy to a city be as important as defeating terrorism? Tell us what you think, and we'll share your comments next time. Till then, Oshakalan, and goodbye.